this is an interesting story, and it's just so apropos to everything we've been talking about recently. We don't know what university this happened to, but this appeared in a Verizon in a Verizon four page brag sheet about you know their involvement in this. Uh, but it was really interesting, uh, and so and it was written in a first-person narrative format that I'll just share as is, although I've edited it a little bit. Sen uh, so it reads, senior members of my university's IT security team um, rotate weekly as on-call incident commanders, <laughs> as they're called at the university, um, in the event that a response is needed. This week was my turn. And as I sat at home, my phone lit up with a call from the help desk. They'd been receiving an increasing number of complaints from students all across campus about slow or inaccessible network connectivity. As always seemed to happen, the help desk had written off earlier complaints and it was well after 9 p.m. when I was finally pulled in. I joined the conference bridge and began triaging the information. Even with limited access, the help desk had found a number of concerns. The name servers responsible for domain name service lookups were producing high volume alerts and showed an abnormal number of subdomains related to seafood. <laughs> As the servers- What? <laughs> Yeah, seafood subdomains, you know, mm -hmm. sushi dot something <laughs> okay. dot mm -hmm. something. As the servers struggled to keep up, legitimate lookups were being dropped. So this was a classic bandwidth flood or, or, or you know, server flood denial of service where the servers were, were overwhelmed with seafood subdomains and so legitimate queries couldn't, you know, couldn't get their IPs resolved. Um, so this was preventing access to the majority of the internet. While this explained the slow network issues, it raised much more concerning questions. From where were all these unusual DNS lookups coming? And why were there so many of them? Were students suddenly interested in seafood dinners? Seemed unlikely. Suspecting the worst, I, he writes, put on a coffee pot and got to work. Now that I had a handle on the incident in general, I began collecting and examining network and firewall logs. The firewall analysis identified over 5,000 discrete systems making hundreds of DNS lookups that is within their internal campus network. Of these, nearly all systems were found to be living on the segment of the network dedicated to our IoT infrastructure. Okay, now, so first, there, there's a little bit of good news. The good news is they have a segment of their network dedicated to their IoT infrastructure, meaning they have a segmented network, which of course is what all, we've also been talking about on this podcast now for, for some months, is the need to give your IoT devices their own network segment. So when this happens, um, you have some control. And also so that when they get taken over, not, not if, when, um, then they'll be blind to the more important portion of your network. So he continues, with a massive campus to monitor and manage, everything from walkway light bulbs to vending machines had been connected to the network for ease of management and improved efficiencies. While these IoT systems were supposed to be isolated from the rest of the network, it was clear that they were configured to use DNS servers in a different subnet. So that was, that's interesting. So there was 
there was they were on their own segment, but DNS had not been isolated. So there, so this little mistake in isolation allowed the the problem on the IoT segment to essentially bring down the rest of the campus. So there's an, in, an interesting data point. Um, of the thousands of domains requested, only 15 distinct IP addresses were returned. Four of these IP addresses and close to 100 of the domains appeared in recent indicator lists for an emerging IoT botnet. So what they found was they'd been infected by an emerging IoT botnet. This botnet was known to spread from device to device by brute forcing default and weak passwords. Once the password was known, the malware had full control of the device and would check in with command infrastructure for updates and change the device's password, then locking us out of those 5,000 devices. This was a mess, he writes. Short of replacing every soda machine and lamp post, I was at a loss for how to remediate the situation. And, and really, you know, think about it. They, they have 5,000 devices that have been commandeered, taken over, and had their passwords replaced. So this is not a small, I mean, <laughs> like, this is the kind of thing that is actually happening now. And, I mean, as he says, how do you remediate this? How do you fix this? He continues, we had known, we had known repeatable processes and procedures for replacing infrastructure and application services, but nothing for an IoT outbreak. Fortunately, a less drastic option existed than replacing all the IoT devices on campus. Analysis of previous malware samples had shown that the control password used to issue commands to infected systems also was used as the newly updated device password. These commands were typically received via HTTP and in many cases did not rely on SSL to encrypt the transmissions. If this was the case for our compromise, a full packet capture could be used to inspect the network traffic and identify the new devices, plural, times 5,000, password. So the plan was to intercept the clear text password for a compromised IoT device over the wire and then use that information to perform a password change before the next malware update. If conducted properly and quickly, we could regain control of our IoT devices. You know, at this point, I'd be holding my breath, my, my breath and crossing everything, all my body parts, fingers and toes and everything else, that this might work. While we waited for the full packet capture solution, I instructed the network operations team to prepare to shut down all network access for our IoT segments once we had intercepted the malware password. Short-lived as it was, the impact from serving all of our IoT devices from the internet during that brief period of time was noticeable across the campus, and we were determined to never have a repeat incident. With the packet device underway, it was only a matter of hours before we had a complete listing of new passwords assigned to newly compromised devices. With these passwords, one of our developers was able to write a script which allowed us to log in and update the password and remove the infection 
across all devices at once. <laughs> Where, whereupon I'd be going, whoo. The whole process took a matter of minutes, and I made a mental note to save that script for later, although I prayed we would never need it we would never need it again. Now that the incident had been com contained, we looked towards ways to prevent it from happening again. So lessons learned. Don't leave, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. Create separate network zones for IOT systems. Air gap them from other critical networks where possible. Don't allow direct ingress and egress connectivity to the internet. Don't forget the importance of an, of an inline proxy or content filtering system. So essentially retrospectively, they're wishing that they, that they all had already had a device in place that was, that was already filtering all of their IOT traffic. They ended up installing that in order to obtain visibility into this IOT segment that then allowed them to capture the password and perform the remediation and also to take it off the net, the, the internet so that they were able to fix all of the compromised devices uh, in isolation. And then they also change dev default credentials on devices, use strong and unique passwords for device accounts and Wi-Fi networks, regularly monitor, and this is where most people fall down, regularly monitor events and logs, um, hunt for threats at endpoints as well as the network level, scan for open remote access protocols to your network and disable commonly unused and unsecured features and services. That's, of course, uh, broadly uh, good advice that aren't being required. Um, and include IoT devices, and this is difficult, in IT asset inventory because there are going to be so many of them. You know, the, 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 this university had 5,000 of these things. You know, they they had all of their their vending machines plugged into the Internet uh, in order to uh, support and improve management. So an interesting and I thought really uh, fascinating story.